Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, I believe the most talented people in this place tonight are specifically teenagers. They know how to wait for an opening. Wait for a gap. Wait for an opportunity to get what they want. Come on, they know how to do it. They're very talented. They, they just, they're better than we used to be. I mean, my goodness, hallelujah. Uh, you know, I'd ask in the midst of a fire, hey, can I get, you know, a $5 allowance? Hallelujah. Praise God. They just know how to create their own opening. It's amazing how talented they can be. And there's something about it that is called tenacity. It's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But I believe that we as a church today need a tenacity. Come on, to create our own opening. Sometimes it just seems like everything, 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 especially in this past year, has tried to stop exactly what God wants to do. No matter where we go, what turn we take, no matter how good we are, no matter how faithful, no matter how much we press in, there's always something that's trying to block what God wants to do. And this is not just in this ministry, this is all over the United States. And I say this, the devil's about to stop. In Jesus' name. So have you ever reached a desperation point? In which you said, I don't care what it takes. I'll do whatever is needed to get breakthrough. Come on. Sometimes you have to be at a pretty hard place to get to that place. Sometimes we get to that place in many areas. Somebody might have their families okay and on fire for God, but they're struggling financially. Somebody might have the finances, but their family's all messed up. And we're going to look at some things in Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. And we're going to look at something that I believe was desperation. Willing to create their own opening. Sometimes if you don't feel like you're getting through, you're going to have to make your own door. Come on. If the enemy can close something in your midst, then guess what? We can open something. I'm getting one amen, one agreement. By the end of this, hopefully somebody else will be agreement. But there were four friends in Mark chapter 2, and they were looking for a breakthrough. And when they brought their paralyzed friend to Jesus, they wanted breakthrough, and they were bound to get that breakthrough. And the house was full, and they couldn't get in. Imagine that. Jesus in a house, and it was full, and you can't get in. They reached a desperation point. We've come too far. We can't get in, and we've come too far. Some of you, we have come too far not to get in. We've come too far to settle anything short. Come on, hallelujah. I'm not going to settle for something that, that was second best. I'm not going to settle for something that isn't God's best. And rather than giving up and going home, that's what a lot of Christians today are doing. We're giving up and we're going home. Whenever we're, we hit a wall, we hit a blockage, we hit a stopping point, we just stop. We need to get a moment of desperation where we want to blow the roof off the place to get in. So they literally removed the ceiling, lowered the paralyzed man down. How many know that was not normal? Could you imagine having a prayer meeting packed? All of a sudden there's a man being dropped by rope right in the middle of the service. You say, oh, they don't, they don't do that today. That's not, that's not what happens today. I think that's part of the problem today. 
We don't have desperation like we should. We allow the enemy to keep us stagnant, stuck, when we are supposed to grow and go to another level. Moments later, their friend received his breakthrough, and he was totally healed. Now, this is a parable that I believe is for our day. Some of you might say, oh, this is an extreme circumstance. It's time to blow the roof off some things if we have to. Come on. Don't you think sometimes the neighbors hear the kids cry? When they're not getting their way. Now if you have one of those neighborhoods that nobody is around, that's one thing. But you hear when the neighbors across the street are in trouble. Come on. You hear when something's going on. You hear when a when a mom or dad is arguing about something. You hear things. We live in a pretty good neighborhood, but the neighborhood sometimes is rocking. It's time to blow the roof off. It's time for our old mindsets to be blown out. Our limited thinking. Come on. Believing the Lord can do extraordinary things. I asked the Lord strongly today and yesterday as I worked on this sermon to light me on fire. So that people can come and watch me burn. Some of God's generals had that same request. They just wanted such a desire for people to come and get to know the Lord the way they knew. We need this application in our life. Making Jesus at home in our house. Is Jesus welcome in your house? Is Jesus welcome in your bedroom? Come on. And I mean the teenagers too. Do you give him room? Do you listen to music he likes? Nice day. See, is Jesus at home in in your house, in your family, in your congregation, or in your city? And what would you need to do in order to make him an honored guest in your house? Make room for him. How, How many know it's a lot easier to bring a baby home when you make room for the baby? Most people don't just go have a baby and come home and go, what are we going to do now? Where are we going to put the baby? Usually you prepare. Now don't get me wrong. I mean, hey, we live in some days now where you're so caught up and, and distracted to where some people can't re- really prepare much room. But we do prepare a space specifically for the baby. See, when Jesus is in his temple, people will gather and revelation will rest on the word of God and I want you to understand God wants to be so full in your life to where we are just consumed with him some becomes dissatisfied even with crowds crowds don't mean anything sometimes I've been in places where the church service is dead and the place is packed I've been in services where the place is dead and the place is empty. You got to understand, we get dissatisfied with crowds, the the amount of people showing up. But you got to understand, four men become, they became desperate. They had a desperation. They were willing to do whatever it took. It didn't matter about the number of people. It didn't matter what was going on. It didn't matter how much closed doors they've had. It didn't matter if they were hindered in any way, shape, or form. They're like, we're going to have to do something else. We're going to have to go outside the box. So you got to understand, I like to study 
geographical things as well as the experience there. Most likely it was during the heat of the day they drugged this paralyzed man. Come on. They didn't have wheelchairs. Come on, they didn't have a scooter for this guy to drive on. They were already exhausted. And they got to this place and they couldn't get in. Come on. How many times do we go someplace and we just don't feel like we can reach out and get what we want? They worked hard to carry the dead weight because you got to understand, the man was paralyzed. He wasn't helping out. See, sometimes I believe we don't realize how desperate we need to get. We always want to go to a service and get just another prophetic word. We just want to get another hands laid on us. We just want to get another this, another that. When God is saying, I want you to get desperate. I want you to reach out for something different. I want you to just say that I might just touch the hem of his garment. I'll be healed. Type of thing. It costs them something get him there after they got there it was full no room no access I don't know about you but I've been in some pretty hot experiences in my life to where you're sweating and you're tired and you're exhausted and you, 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 your muscles are tired so which one of these guys said hey I bet you we can get him through that rough. They could not get near Jesus due to the crowd. They could have given up so easy. But instead, they moved from the natural into a supernatural, into a solution. I can't do this right now. Guess what? There's got to be a solution. I can't make it where we're going right now. There has to be a solution. And no, it's not necessarily going to be the solution like we all think. Well, we'll just wait till the crowd dwindles. Come on, this was Jesus. It wasn't going to dwindle. Nobody was going to leave. Perhaps a divine thought came. You can tear off the roof of the house. I don't know about you, but that just sounds like a prayer meeting I want to be at. Where people are tearing the roof off to get in. I understand that sounds a little strange, and I bet for a moment I would probably be upset if people were tearing the roof off right now because there's room in here. But you got to understand that we get to a place sometimes they, they proceeded up into the roof to tear it open with their hands. They didn't bring tools with them. See, I like to think about things that aren't really there, but they're there. They're tired, they're hot, they're, they're sweaty, and they're exhausted, and they get there, and they're like, we're going to go up there and rip this open somehow with our hands. Doesn't matter what part of the world you're in. That's not going to be a, just an easy task. They dug a big hole in the roof, creating an open heaven is what God said. Whenever I, I, I began to see the big hole in the roof, God said that was an open heaven. Open me. They lowered their friend into the presence of the Messiah. Whew. Jesus saw their faith. Whose faith? All their faith. He saw their faith. Then he spoke to the paralytic man. Your sins are forgiven. <laughs> See, this resulted in healing of his body. May these words echo through our lives today. And may our sick bodies right now be whole just by the presence of the Lord. I believe a lot of churches today aren't experiencing a lot of presence of the Lord. And one of the reasons why is we are, do, do not have that, that tenacity that we need. That desperation that we need. I 
God said it's time for open heavens. It's time for the heavens to be open right here in Raymond. How many have ever had an encounter that you know was God? Something that you just, nobody can ever take it away from you. You remember the details. You remember uh, 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 substantial things about it, and it changed you. Come on. No matter how long it's been since you had an encounter, it still was a good time. There's a lot of encounters in the Word of God that refer to open heavens. Where the manifested presence of God seems to come down in a tangible manner, bringing conviction of sin, con conversions, healings, miracles, visions, encounters. An actual hole that seems to be appearing in the immediate sky. Just right there. I'm supposed to go through several scriptures real quick. It's going to refer to open heaven experiences. When as I read these open heaven experiences, God said this. He said it's going to cause a hunger and a desire for open heaven experiences. I wish some people would get it at school. Right in the middle of the class. When they're on their cell phone, but they're supposed to be studying. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 28, verse 16 and 17. In the times of Jacob... We need the gates of heaven to open over our cities, churches, and families. Ezekiel 1, 1 through 4, talks about the skies rolled back and the prophets saw heaven and the four living creatures. Come on. And the river of fire in the ancient of days. Matthew 3, 13 through 17. I'm, I'm just referring to some parts of these. The heavens were open. At the water baptism of Jesus and the voice of the Father came, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then in John 1, 29 through 34, it talked about John the Baptist saw in the spirit realm the heavens open and the dove of God descended it and remained upon Jesus Christ. Like also in Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, we need to blow off the roof. I like to say it that way myself anyway. Of our limited thinking and mindsets. And believe the Lord for extraordinary grace for the works of God. Desperate times calls for desperate measures. How many have ever tried something so hard for so long and nothing was happening? But then you try to figure out, okay, we're going to do something about this. It's about to get extreme in here. Come on. Hallelujah. Desperate times calls for desperate measures. Some of those desperate times can be like a time when I was trying to get a wire out of a house. And when you try to get wire out of a house so that you can put new wire in, your first goal is not to tear the walls out. Because the more walls you open, the worse it gets. The more expect inspections, the more codes that you have to get updated, and everything has to be updated. The more you open, the worse it gets. So you fight and fight and fight to get the wire out. And I remember one time I was fighting to get a wire out of a wall, and then all of a sudden I just couldn't do it anymore. I was tired. I'd been in the attic for hours. I'd been in downstairs for hours, in the attic for hours, and the wire was stuck somewhere. So then what do you do? You get the sledgehammer. Something's opening up now. And you bang on that wall for a while, and, and come to find out they tied a knot in the, wall, in the wire in the wall. I was never going to get it out. So I, that, come on. So extreme measures came. 
to get what needed to be done now. I believe we as a church right now, we're getting extreme measures. I'm, we are, I know for me and my house, we are at the desperate time. We're at the desperate time that is required right now, and it's required right now for desperate measures. We need to be desperate laborers to arise who are not content with life. We're not supposed to be content with our life all the time. That's why the church stops growing. We stop maturing. We stop, we, where there is no vision, the people perish. Why? Because the enemy gets us to a place where we're satisfied and we're stagnant. I believe we are never, ever supposed to stop growing. Say, oh, I got ordained such and such day. Well, praise God. That doesn't mean you don't continue to grow. We're supposed to grow. Our desperation, our hunger is supposed to grow. Our life is not supposed to be as is. Come on. We're sold out as is. Come on. If it's as is, that means it's not that good. To tear the roof off in order to lower another into the presence of Jesus. That's what kind of tenacity we need in our life right now. What do we got to do, God, to get over this? Whatever it is, we're going to do it. If I need to take this young lady and put her through a roof to get to the presence of the Lord, then guess what? There's going to be a rope tie in time. Come on. <laughs> She's probably getting nervous. That's okay. So we have three keys that we need to receive before we go. Sometimes little keys open big doors. Uh -huh. They create an opening in heaven. Always remember that little keys can always open in big doors. I've been spending a lot of time remembering some of the books I read growing up in ministry and books by, you know, Smith Wigglesworth, John G. Lake, Catherine Kuhlman. I, I, I was so hungry and desperate to learn from these type of people and, and just find, you know, where's the keys? Where's the secrets? What, what did they find? What did they understand? What did they learn that I'd ever, I, you know, that, that, that I haven't learned yet? And many times as I went through these books and I would read them and I would read them again and I would study the scriptures, I would find they, all the keys were pretty much the same and they were all simple. It really wasn't some complicated thing. It was not usually some big thing to where I had to have four years of, of Bible education to find the Lord or find the presence. It was sometimes just belief. Sometimes it was just simple. Ah, yes. Prayer opens the way. You know, one thing, I, I, we talked about this weekend. Every time there's somebody sick at school or something going on in the school district, everybody's praying. At least that's what they say on Snapchat. You know, I'm praying for her. Sometimes that right there is as much prayer has come forth. Come on. Because I don't know about you, but if we had a thousand people praying for somebody, many times there would be angels sent to flight. Miracles would be taking place. And don't get me wrong, I'm serious about that. If we were really a praying school, I believe there would be a change in our school. Thank you, Jesus. Some of these celebrities, oh, we're praying for their families. Are you really? Or are you just saying that on Twitter? Come on. Come on, some of the politicians, you know, our prayers are with them. When have you prayed lately? 
I don't know about you, but I'm tired of just the political correctness of our nation, our schools, our education system. We need to get back to praying. Come on, talking to the Lord about what's going on right now. I don't know about you, but my children need to find the fire of God in such a way that they will never be the same again. As I said, I like to study revivalists like Charles Finney and Evan Roberts. I studied some again about the testimony of Evan Roberts. He was in the Welsh revival in 1904. And one of his comments always was, God is listening. He was a man of prayer. Many times he was simple. At age 13, young Evan Roberts became consumed with a desire for revival. 13. Especially among the youth. He was consumed with revival. At 13. Has anybody known 13 year olds? I don't know about you, but it was probably a good thing Evan didn't have access to Snapchat. Come on. Come on. It was probably a good thing he didn't have a Facebook account. Come on, or, or, or you know, all the different things. He didn't have access to it. Why? Because guess what? His tenacity, his hunger, his desperation, what his life was about. To be consumed with a desire for revival. I'm 13. I want to have a desire for revival. Okay. The church has issues with teenagers getting on fire for revival. He asked an elder at his church a question. And this is recorded in history. When God comes, and when that, what he meant by that, with his manifested presence... Where does he first appear? Come on, this is the 13-year-old boy. When God comes, how does he appear first? Where? The older gentleman, who had been a part of a previous move of the Holy Spirit, replied this. When God comes, he always comes first at the prayer meeting. A lot of our churches across America right now, we have Wednesday night prayer, Thursday night prayer, Tuesday night prayer. Shouldn't we have revival if we really have prayer meetings? Come on, Sunday, we'll be packed out, Holy Ghost religious suits and dresses, and we all look pretty and nice. On Wednesday, you know, there's, you know, half a dozen show up. I'm just saying facts, come on. And they might be praying, but guess what? It seems like they're praying and they don't have the tenacity that they need. There might be one, there might be two. And, and if you have a church that is praying, praise God. But I know a lot of churches during these prayer meetings we would have and we would come together and, and I would be there and I'd be like, come on, let's pray and let's bury our face in the floor and just cry out, God, we need a move of God. We need our youth touched. We need a, a mountain to come down in our state so that God can be seen. I would see a lot of people and they were consumed by having Kool-Aid after we was done and, and, you know, a piece of cake and a cookie. And it's like, I went to these morning minister luncheons and breakfasts and different things and sometimes we would go and, and most of it would be sleeping. We'd have our breakfast and then we were supposed to pray. Yeah, have a 45, 50-year-old man eat his breakfast really early, early in the morning, like 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, eat breakfast, and come on, what's going to happen? Yeah, you hear snoring. That was our prayer meetings. So Evan started attending prayer meetings everywhere. He got to the place to where he would attend four nights a week a prayer meeting. Now think about this. He was a boy. 13 years old, and he was trying to go to four different places that were having prayer meetings. <laughs> P. 
people have a hard time showing up their own church on prayer meeting. For the next 13 years, he gave his life and to participating in prayer meetings for an unprecedented revival. Now, after attending Bible school, he went to Northern Wales, uh, Wales and, and, and ever returned to his home. And, and you got to understand, he was 26 by this time. And now I know that means he was still very young. <laughs> And on the first night, there were only 13 people in a hometown meeting. 13 people showed up to a meeting. But then the crowds at Mariah Chapel, where the gathering centered on prayer and singing of hymns, began to grow nightly. first person saved was one of Evan, Evan's siblings. Whew. How many know he, he was pressing for, for a revival and one of his siblings gets saved? He'd already had success. He was already excited. He was already moving. He taught the people to pray two simple prayers. One thing about a lot of the generals, God's generals and different things, they were very repetitive. Come on. You could go to the service, and every time you went to a service, you're like, oh, I already heard this sermon. You might have heard what they say, but you didn't hear the sermon. They just said it the same way, a different way, and kept saying it. Why? Because it worked. And he would have two simple prayers. Send the Spirit now for Jesus Christ's sake. Come on, that was just a prayer. He would just, send the Spirit now for Jesus Christ's sake. Then he would say, send the Spirit now more powerfully for Jesus Christ's sake. What happened? The Spirit came down. The Spirit came down. The Holy Spirit came down. Eventually, there was 100,000 souls recorded, saved in the Welsh revival. Started with a 13-year-old boy vision. And a 26-year-old man permitting for 13 people and turned into 100,000 souls. So you can understand people talk about all these different revivals and, and they keep talking about, oh, once upon a time. Guess what? I've been in revival. I've led revival. I've seen miracles, signs, and wonders. But guess what? It's time for now. It's not time for history. I gotta, we got to understand we're pressing somewhere now. God's about to move right now. I'm not talking about what's happened and what's been. Uh, guess what? I've seen it. God bless the things I've seen. But we're in a time right now. God's about to move. And we're going to see it right now. I want to testify, testi testify about what happened last week. I want to testify about what happened last month. I don't want to just talk about what happened 10 years ago. There's a cry that is arising right now that's saying, More! And there must come a youth revolution. God's coming upon the youth to move in a hunger that's going to be a revolution. You know, there's something trying to happen in America right now. Everybody's holding a picket sign, and they're doing it for immigration. They're doing it for women's rights. They're doing it for sexual misconducts. They're doing it for this. They're doing marches all over the nation, and they're doing it for abortion, and they're doing it for pro-life or pro-choice, and they're doing it for all the different things. But you got to understand, we're about to step into a time where God is wanting to move upon the young people to march for Jesus Christ, to stand for what is right, to draw... People to the Lord. And the key also is prophetic. We need prayer, but we also need prophetic. Prophetic becomes a powerful tool. It opens closed minds. 
Some of us have closed minds. Come on. Closed doors. It opens closed doors. It opens closed situations. Sometimes a prophetic word, even a word that comes from the pulpit, it's prophetic, by the way. When I preach, it's prophetic, and it's opening up doors in your life tonight. It's opening up things that hasn't been open for a season or, or years. Some of us have been closed. We just had dead areas in our life, and God tonight is opening them up and saying, we're coming in, and we're about to move through your life now. It's time to put the key in the door and turn it. People come to a service. See, sometimes we can go to church every week, every week, every week. Nothing happens. And you can show up to one prophetic meeting. It's not just preaching another sermon, not just teaching another sermon. But there's something that happens that opens a door that you haven't been able to get open for a very long time. That's why many times when my wife and family, we've gone somewhere and we've gone on vacation or something, many times a lot of our vacations have been wrapped around revival. We go somewhere else to get something. One thing I've seen over the years, a lot of ministers, they get so caught up in their own ministry, they won't go get anything from anybody else. We got, come on, we got to go receive also. I don't know about you, but I, I never am thinking in myself so much that I'm, I'm above every other minister. I can receive from anybody else. These scriptures I'm going to go through real quick. They help us understand why we need a hunger for the voice of God. Deuteronomy 8.3 says, man lives by God's word. See, we got to live by God's word. Do you live by God's word? Has anybody here got prophetic words, a little cassette tape that you haven't listened to for years and years and years that still hasn't been fulfilled in your life? Matthew 4.4 4 says, man lives by the ever proceeding word of God. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. Luke chapter 11 verse 52. We must use the key. And not hinder others. See sometimes God will give you something that just boom. This is exactly what I need. Many times my wife and I we will be. We can be going through whatever we're going through. And we'll go sit in a man of God's service and, or a woman of God's service. And when she says or he says one thing, yeah, we know it doesn't matter if they come up to us and say God says. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter if they know us or don't know us. Sometimes there's just something that they say. And it goes right into our spirit. It goes right between our spirit and our flesh. And it divides and it separates things. And it's just something that's just like, Yes. I don't know what it is. We received something tonight, and it was just a yes. We know we received it. Another key is the presence. We need the presence of God. We need prayer. We need the prophetic. But we need the presence. I don't believe we are should really give God ultimatums. But I've done it. Come on. I told him if I don't have something real, something tangible in my life, I'm never preaching the word of God again. If I don't have you show up, God, in a way in my life to where I know that you're real in my life more than just receiving a prophetic word more. I'm talking about the presence. I want to see your presence. I want to feel your presence. And I just kept saying that every time I would pray. I'm like, Lord, this is it. I'm, I've only got a few services left, and I'm not scheduling another one. I'm not going anywhere else. I'm not preaching another service until you show up to where that I know that I know that I know that you're wanting to go a, a higher level, a deeper level. And, get, and I tell you, and, and I tell you, he showed up. We need his presence more than anything. The outstanding, distinguishing characteristics of God. 
comes through the presence. There's things that you will experience in the presence of God that you will never experience anything else, anywhere else. Exodus 33, 12 through 23, talks about where God gave Moses his request and revealed his glorious presence. So you've got to understand. God told him, as he said, I will show you my glory. I don't think Moses knew what he was talking about. I will show you my glory. In Exodus 25, 30, it talks about the bread of his presence, which is also the showbread of his presence, was used by the priests in ministering to the Lord. They would break, they would bake unleavened bread and and, and lay it out as an offering unto the Lord. And we've done that in services. We've done that in ministry. And, 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 and I'm telling you, there's times where we do it. Why? Because you're making a place for the Lord. You're inviting His presence. See, we're temples of the living God. And He wants us to be carriers of His presence. We need to care for his presence. God gave me a kind of a sweet illustration of how we're to care for his presence, and he's never showed me this this way before. He wants us to yearn for his presence, pray for his presence, love his presence, nurture his presence. After all, isn't this what we have longed for in our life. You know, when you're born into this world, it's a glorious experience. When a child is born, if anybody has ever been there, and and I'm not talking about when you were there, I'm talking about (laughs) if you've ever been there where somebody else is there, it's a glorious experience. And God has showed me at times that when a baby comes into this world, the presence of God is on them. They have not experienced anything out here. That's why many times as a child comes out, they are so susceptible to good things and and bad things. They're so susceptible. They're so receiving. And they grow up and sometimes you can have a little child that will praise the Lord and the teenagers will just stand still. Why? Because there's something I believe that happens even as they come into this world. See, when will revival come? Sometimes you get it when you get up in the middle of the night. Sometimes you get revival when you get up in the middle of the night and reply to the Lord. Has anybody here ever been woke up in the night and all you do all night is fight to get back to sleep? And it never works. I mean, you're just like struggling all night long, man. I, I just couldn't get back to sleep. Sometimes you're supposed to get up for a snack, not for Netflix. Come on, you're not supposed to turn it, turn on the TV or something to try to. Oh, uh, you're not supposed to just make some more milk. Sometimes. Sometimes you're supposed to be doing something, and God's calling you in the midnight hour. You know, many times if you respond, and I I put myself in here too, if you respond in the middle of the night, what I call night feedings, the presence of God, we're supposed to nurture like a baby. Anybody ever had a newborn in your house? They want fed all the time. Come on. As soon as you get to sleep, And when the baby comes out, teenagers sometimes will be, they'll say the, these so sweet words, I will, I will get up with her, I will do things with her, I, I will be right there. And, and then, you know, after the 50th time of them waking up within the, 
you know, 72-hour period, hallelujah, <laughs> and, and just screaming that they want something. They need something. One time they need change. One time they need fed. Another time they need change and fed. Now, you know, you never know sometimes. Sometimes you just, you know, you have to, have to ask them what they want. Hallelujah. But I'm telling you, you're nurturing. You're waking up in the midnight hour, and you're nurturing, and you're doing, you're feeding. And I'm telling you, the, the presence of God, if you want the presence of God in your life, when, when the presence of God wakes you up in the night, that is a time he might want you to feed. Woo! So when you say no, I just want to go back to sleep. Many times when you do a feeding real quick, they'll go right back out. Come on. Sometimes you fall asleep with them in your arms. Good times. See, you're supposed to hold a child of new beginnings close to your bosom. You're supposed to wash it with the love and compassion. Revival will come if you give compassion to the needs of the present. Let his manifest presence come. Let his manifest presence come. I'm telling you, it is like nurturing. We're supposed to nurture the spirit of God in our midst. God, we want revival to come. Well, guess what? That means we cannot fit a program around it. We're going to have to just let the presence mess up the program. When I was pastoring for several years, you got to understand, one of the first things God did, he told me, he said, throw out the program. Come on, every month we would, we would be so consumed and worried about, you know, having happy birthday to this person, happy anniversary to this one, you know, trying to make everybody so happy. And God said, I, there's no room for me in that. You're, you're not going to allow me to come. So I just took that little thing and I just tore it up and I threw it and I said, we're not having programs here anymore. And people in the church, some just said, could you at least just print them out for us to where we can use them out? We'll pick them up on the way out just so we can get our pizza man discount. <laughs> Come on. They used to give 10% off just because you had a church program. How many believe that I let them have printed out? Of course not. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> they said, you could even send me the file and I'll print it out my own. Hallelujah. Some people just don't get it. The presence of God is worth a lot more than 10% discounts. Hallelujah. I want to pray a prayer. We need to pray a prayer together. We need to pray a prayer right now. And I, I, I really want you to understand that when we pray this, I want you to pray together. When we pray this, I believe something's supposed to change in our life. Your desires are, are, are about to change. How many know sometimes desires change? Hallelujah. Teenagers are going to change. And what we're praying for is open heavens. But you're going to have to respond. Sometimes in the midnight hour, you're going to be woke up and you're going to need to get up. Maybe just spend a few minutes with the Lord. You know, many times when you do that, you'll go right back out. But if you just fight it, guess what? You stay up longer and longer and longer. You say, oh, I, I need to get up early. I got school. I got this. I got that. Well, guess what? Sometimes a few minutes with the Lord is all he's looking for. And then he might just say, okay, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. Spend some time with me. You're not asleep anyway. I woke you up. Because I want to spend some time with you. Now, I know a lot of us re reply like a husband to a wife. 
you know, a wife that might stay up cleaning or something and stay up late and the husband's already asleep and then she comes to bed and she wants to talk. No matter how good a guy you are, you just don't know how to put it, program that into your system. I mean, you try, but you just don't know how to program it. It's like, what do you want? You know, loving your wife like Christ loved the church after you've already been asleep is a very hard time. Come on, just being honest. Hallelujah. And she's just, she's all energized. She's been cleaning for hours. You know, she's been watching some church. She's been doing this. She's been reading some notes. You know, she got stirred up and she got some questions. She got some things that, you know, she needs to talk about now. Hallelujah. And, and uh, are you asleep? Well, if I answer, then I'm not. Hallelujah. So you try not to answer. I'm just confessing. I'm getting set free right now. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Then you wake up, and, and it's not simple questions like, you know, where's the shampoo now? Or where's it, you know, what happened to the shaving cream? Or, you know, something's, you know, very innocent. But it's usually something very in-depth. It's going to require all signals to be, you know, on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I never said you did. Hallelujah. I'm the only one sweating in here, I think. Hallelujah. But see, when God wakes you up, you're all full of signals. Because you're wide awake. When he wakes you up, you're awake. That's why it's hard to go back to sleep. And some of you are very good at trying to go back to sleep. I mean, you're good. You're like, whatever. I'll just put a pillow over my head. Come on. I'll just, you know, I'll just do whatever I got to do. I'll turn on some jam music. or I'll do whatever I got to do to put myself out. I'm going to put myself to sleep. Thing is, sometimes you're putting the presence to sleep too. Thank you, Jesus. So repeat after me. And you shouldn't have a choice. You should do this. We're praying for open heavens. So repeat after me. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we desire to cherish and love your presence, your manifested presence in our lives. As a parent does, its newborn child. We want to see an open heaven created over our lives. Families, congregations, cities, Nations, we want to see a move of the Holy Spirit in our day as in the former moves of the Spirit in Wales. And many other times and places, send your Holy Spirit now more powerfully for Jesus Christ's sake, amen and amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, sometimes you don't even realize. Sometimes we need to realize. If anything you remember of this tonight, I want you to remember this. A 13-year-old boy had a desire for revival. He was 13, and he had a desire for revival. And he went to a bunch of prayer meetings in a week. Could you imagine teenagers asking go to a prayer meeting all the time. They asked to do a lot of things, but I, I, I can't remember the last time, you know, somebody said, hey, can we go to a prayer meeting? Hallelujah. 
Now they'll just say, call everything a prayer meeting now. Hallelujah. That's not going to work. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Come on. But they go to a prayer meeting, and all of a sudden, and for years, experience in life changing hunger and desire. I want you to think about the 100,000 souls that God saved. 100,000. I don't know about you, but that's a massive number. That's a massive number of souls to get saved. See, God wants to move like he did in Azusa Street. He wants to move like he did in the Welsh Revival. He wants to move like he did in Pensacola, Brownsville. He wants to move like he did right there in Litchfield. He wants to move in the power of his might. And he wants to move like he did in the tent meetings right here in the United States. He wants to touch. He wants to heal. He wants to set free. But guess what? We got to change. We got to nurture the presence of God. We got to pray. We got to allow the prophetic to come forth. And guess what? When the prophetic comes, we got to receive what the prophetic says. You know, sometimes prophetic offends. Come on. Sometimes we get offended by the prophetic. God's speaking, but if it doesn't fit exactly what we want to hear, it can be offensive. You know, I can't imagine. I've received more things over the last several years that I know God has spoke to my heart, to me, that I wasn't real fond to hear. Sometimes he speaks to you and it's not always fluff. If anything, the more you receive, the more depth he will speak to your heart. God is speaking all the time, and we're just not able to hear. So we need to pray. We need to tap into that prophetic voice, and we need to find the presence of God and nurture the presence of God before it's too late. We all want a move of God, but we don't know how to get it. This five-year-old back here, she wants God to show up. And she probably could pass every person in this building up because of her faith. That's sad for some of us. We've been doing this a long time. We've seen a lot of things. We've seen a lot of experiences. But I believe God's going to move in such a way that even the young people are going to see visions Come on. They're going to prophesy. They're going to know the Lord. They're going to know his presence. And they're going to have experiences. And I'm telling you, it's going to scare religion right out the door. We've got to make room. We've got to make room. We've got to make something happen. Stop waiting for something to happen. Come on. Hallelujah. Sometimes when things break in your house, you don't just wait for it to come back. Hallelujah. You got to make something happen. You got to make a call. You got you to get something moving to get it to be fixed. You got to get something moving. Otherwise, it's never going to be fixed. Same thing goes with the things of God. We got to make something happen. I don't know about you, but the things that we need to happen right now are not just for our lives, but it's for our children's lives. Because I want things to be so open in their lives because I see the world we live in. Come on, another synagogue just shut up. You gotta understand, we live in a dangerous nation. And I do mean, I love America. I'm red, white, and blue. I believe in America, and I'm, I'm behind America, and I, I love America. But you got to understand, there's things happening in America right now that is not a spirit of God. It's a spirit of antichrist that is rising up in our world. And we need to understand, we might be a free nation, but sometimes that's become part of our problem. Come on. To where there's more things that are dangerous more than ever right here in America because they've had the right to do so. Come on. And I'm not saying that we need some kind of shift, change, or anything. What we need is revival. 
Come on, I'm not asking for laws to be changed drastically. I'm not even going to preach about gun laws. I'm not going to preach about this or that. What I'm going to preach about is we need revival because when revival comes to America in a way that we need it to where it impacts every corner of the nation, guess what? These things will stop. These things will shift. There will be people that will pick up weapons, will not be able to shoot them. Why? Because they're going to be frozen by the power of God. Because there were days in the revivals, moves of, of the past, where God would move so strong in that city to where the bars would run out of business. Why? Because the people that were drinking alcohol could not drink. Come on, the presence of God was so strong in the city to where the bars could not sell the alcohol because the people couldn't drink. Come on, I don't know about you, but that's the type of move of God I want to see in America. Oh, we just give you praise. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask my wife to play a song. While the song plays, I want you to just open your life up to the Lord and say, come in. Let's do it. You have a way that you want to do something? Help us to move in the desperation. I know a lot. most people in this room, you're desperate. But remember, it's time to call for desperate measures. In Jesus' name.